Good morning, and welcome to the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership's 17th Annual Greater Palm Springs Economic Summit. I'm your MC, Laura James. The theme of this year's summit is Pursuit. The past year and a half has presented challenges nobody could have imagined, and our area has been hugely impacted. Our speakers today will discuss the most current data and research and share their ideas and calls to action. We encourage you to tweet your thoughts during the program using hashtag CVAP Summit. To kick off today's program, please welcome the chair of the CVAP board, Jan Harnick. Thank you, Laura, and good morning. Welcome to the 2021 CVEP Summit. I'm Jan Harnick, and I serve on the Palm Desert City Council and as a chairperson of the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership, or CVEP. At last year's summit, during devastating business closures and public health emergencies, our summit speakers explain the meaning and the ideas behind the 2020 summit theme, Becoming Essential. And now in 2021, those ideas become actions. With this year's theme, Pursuit, our speakers will outline the reality of today's Coachella Valley economy as it emerges from the pandemic. They will identify some of our challenges and our most promising opportunities to improve our regional economy in a sustainable way and in a way it can evolve as needed. For the board of directors and staff at CVAP, Relentless pursuit has meant maintaining existing programs and adding new ones to serve more local businesses and our changing needs. It has meant keeping the doors open at the Palm Springs and Indio iHubs and opening new doors at the Palm Desert iHub, assisting entrepreneurs valley-wide as they bring their products to market. Relentless pursuit has meant working more closely than ever with local stakeholders guiding the region beyond recovery and into prosperity. As chairperson, I thank CVEP's board of directors for their leadership and willingness to dedicate their resources towards the pursuit of shared regional goals. This board of directors faced trials during this complicated time and made their decision to look at the big picture the long-term picture and work stronger for a stronger Coachella Valley. And as always, we appreciate all our sponsors who steadfastly stepped up and continued their support. Events like this require the support of many people and organizations. And before I turn this back over to Laura, we'll take a moment to thank the sponsors who've helped make this event possible. Our platinum sponsor, Hunter Johnson. Our gold sponsor, Wells Fargo Bank. We also thank our silver sponsors. Our partners. Our city sponsors. Media sponsors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. And now, Please welcome the CEO of the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership, Joe Wallace. Good morning and welcome to the 2021 CVEP Economic Summit. I'm Joe Wallace, the Chief Executive Officer and the Chief Innovation Officer of the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership. Our theme this year is pursuit. And pursuit is what defines what you will be because no matter who you are, what group you're a part of today, you are what you chose per to pursue in the past and persevered to achieve. If you really want something, it's not enough to just call it and say, hey, I'm gonna pursue it. You have to do it and you have to do it relentlessly. Relentless pursuit is not fashionable. Relentless pursuit is not the flavor of the month or the year and maybe not even the decade. Relentless pursuit requires effort, patience, and determination. Relentless pursuit requires unwavering commitment. Relentless pursuit requires continuous and sufficient investment. Relentless pursuit, to do that takes a region because a village isn't quite enough. Telecommuters relentlessly have pursued the Coachella Valley in the last year. 
the beginning of the pandemic, CVEP launched a uh, social media campaign to try and attract telecommuters from the Bay Area, from the Seattle area, and from Orange County who are in professions that telecommuting makes good sense. The timing could not have been better. Telecommuters have moved in and they have helped create a massive amount of wealth in this valley by driving our house prices up. According to Market Watch, the housing stock in the, in the Coachella Valley, the median family home has increased in price by $160,000 since March of 2020. Given that we have 175,000 or so houses in the valley, that translates into a wealth creation of $28 billion. Yes, that's with a B. $28 billion that can be accessed to do home improvements to go on vacations, to invest in other opportunities, to make our valley better and, and wealthier, and to spread some of that wealth through investing in activities of other people. So telecommuters have been a godsend to us, and we're very pleased to have been the ones that launched that attraction campaign. Balkanization is the enemy of pursuit. This 100,000 denarii note is from the former nation known as Yugoslavia. It was formed right in around, around the end of World War II, and at that time, this note would have bought two man years of skilled labor. Today, that note is worth zero. Why? Because these seven countries couldn't get along with each other. They didn't cooperate. They didn't make the bigger dream possible. They broke into parts and they eventually formed seven countries that are ethnic and they don't like each other. They've even conducted war against each other and it's because they couldn't get along. They didn't pursue the dream of a united Yugoslavia. Vision is what drives a decision to pursue things and that pursuit then drives the impact. Hospitality's domination in the Coachella Valley is a result of endless pursuit. In 1999, a funding mechanism was put together to market this region, and today, over $21 million a year of taxpayer dollars is dedicated to trying to attract tourists to come here, to have a good time, to spend a little money on the side. Regional economic development, on the other hand, is funded with less than a half a million dollars a year. So that's a 42 to 1 differential between attracting tourists and trying to diversify the economy, which all of the Valley's leaders understand and accept is a good thing to do. Silicon Valley is a result of relentless pursuit of technology and a relentless pursuit of wealth. Austin, Texas, the new home of former Californian Elon Musk, happened because of a relentless pursuit to turn the cow town into a tech place. And they've done it. They've done a great job. Exceptional educational systems are a result of relentless pursuit of excellence in education. State-of-the-art infrastructure, like bandwidth, is a result of relentless pursuit always to be at the leading edge of the ability to communicate. Is economic diversification truly valued and desired by the people of and the leaders of the Coachella Valley? I ask that question because I'd love to have an answer. Relentless pursuit, assuming the answer will be yes, and the commitment to that pursuit is the only path to the kind of prosperity that true regional economic development that's funded correctly will be able to make happen. The other speakers today, that we got some great ones. I'm the only fellow that's going to be talking today that doesn't have a PhD. That's because I finished the coursework and then went off to start a company. Uh, for me, that was the right choice. But our first speaker will be Dr. Stone James. He has a doctoral thesis from the University of Southern California. So with you guys. But his thesis was on the economic development, the state of economic development in the Coachella Valley. He's going to talk to you about some of his findings. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Mike Stull and soon to be Dr. Ezekiel Bonias, former CVEP employee, on the role of entrepreneurship in that path to a prosperous future that's a diversified economy. 
Finally, we're going to hear from our old friend Dr. Manfred Kyle on the economy, past, present, and maybe the future. And I say maybe because the last year has been full of chaos, and it's kind of hard to synthesize what comes out of chaos to make good predictions on, on a week-to-week, month-to-month, or a year-to-year basis. There's going to be long-term ramifications, and I hope to see Manfred uh, come, come to us and talk to us about uh, what some of those ramifications might be. You know, the, some things haven't changed, though. The things that were game changers before the pandemic are still our game changers, and they're things that we want to pursue. One is a comprehensive university system that turns out people with STEM degrees, and adult retraining for coding and other types of, uh, of skills whenever automation starts to demolish some of our low-end jobs. State-of-the-art communications, we needed it before, we need it now. We still need to be able to drive from one end of the valley to the other without dropping a cell call. We desperately need public education to be competitive at the K-12 through level because that's the feeder system into the universities that we need. We really do need to act regionally better than we have been, and we need to use it on important objectives that are too big for cities to, to do on their own. We do have a big problem at the Salton Sea. But you know what? If the state will get involved, as they've promised to do on many occasions, and the federal government will get involved, that will get fixed. But it's one of the things that it's a big threat to us environmentally, and we need to have that done. But most importantly, we really need for a ubiquitous vision to be accepted by the people of the Coachella Valley. And we need a populace that's aware. They'll know why stuff happens, why this happened, why that happened. We need an aware and educated populace, and mostly we need a population that cares enough to stay apprised of what's going on in the Coachella Valley. We need accountability. The vision for the future, and I don't pretend that this is the only part of the vision. This is the vision that CVEP has been working toward, and we're always open to listen to you as to what other things we might be considering. Entrepreneurship is still the highest probability game changer economically. We need to continue to capitalize on telecommuters, encourage them to get together, get to know each other, get these highly intelligent people in tech to talk to each other. Maybe they'll start new businesses. Maybe they'll help us grow the economy in a way that is diversified and more inclusive. We still need bandwidth. We need STEM. We need investment. We need in a good education system from kindergarten through, through doctoral programs. And to get that, we have to do it regionally. There's much work to be done in the next decade, maybe two decades, and it will inquire, require investments, patience, and most of all, perseverance. The virus of the century, as I told you last year, is still the opportunity of the century. Will the Coachella Valley use this opportunity and relentlessly pursue the economy that we all know we need to have? Thank you. I'm Joe Wallace. Let's pursue things together. Let's move forward. Make it all happen. Goodbye. Thank you, Joe. Now, let me share with you some background on our next speaker, Stone James. Stone is the Economic Development Director for the City of Cathedral City, where he brings more than 25 years of private and public sector experience to his role. His experience with residential and commercial land investment and development has meant involvement in projects ranging from $200,000 up to more than $50 million. Prior to joining the team at Cathedral City, he served as the Vice President for Land Advisors Organization for the entire Coachella Valley Imperial Valley, and Morongo Basin. He earned his Master of Real Estate Development from the University of Southern California and a Bachelor of Business Administration from Gonzaga University. And in August of this year, he successfully defended his dissertation, completing all the requirements for his Doctor of Policy, Planning, and Development degree from the University of Southern California. Please welcome Dr. Stone James. Thank you, Laura. And with that, let's jump into the presentation. So what motivated this research? In 2015, I had been a resident of the Coachella Valley for about 10 years. 
uh, by virtue of my time in the real estate development field, I really try to be a student of the economy. I try to understand the micro trends and the macro trends so that I could ideally understand and predict future demand and supply for residential and commercial real estate. And so despite being a student of the economy, I still felt like I was scratching at the surface, that there were bigger questions that left that were unanswered. And I wanted to learn and I wanted to know more. Some of the big questions for me was, is the economy getting better or getting worse? When I first came to the Coachella Valley in 2005, fast forward to 2015, a lot of development had, had occurred, had taken place. So does that mean that our economy is getting better? So those were some of the questions that I entered this doctoral journey with. So for those who are joining us from outside of the Kajel Valley, I thought it would take a minute to describe this beautiful place that we call home. The Coachella Valley, or also Greater Palm Springs, is an area in eastern Riverside County that is about 410 square miles. It begins at the Morongo Pass, at the foothills of the San Jacinto Mountains, at the 10 Freeway, and goes all the way down to the Salton Sea. And within this Coachella Valley, this wonderfully diverse place that we call home, there are nine cities. There are five unincorporated communities within the unincorporated portions of Riverside County. And unique to this region, there are five tribal nations. So you take that, all of those different communities, combined with over 100 golf courses and countless tennis courts, you've got an area that's a, a wonderful place to live, work, play, and recreate. One of the other defining features of Coachella Valley is the sun. We have 350 days of annual sunshine. So that makes the hiking and the cycling or the golfing and the tennis easy and enjoyable. So the research approach that I used for this doctoral dissertation was grounded theory. That's one of predominantly the six most popular qualitative research methods. And an underpinning of granted theory is the fact that I needed to identify critical people to interview. With granted theory, unlike quantitative analysis, you're not going for huge numbers. You're actually going to interview a very uh, small, carefully picked uh, group of individuals to really dig through the data. And so I felt the people that were best informed, that touched the broadest number of lives within the Coachella Valley were the city managers. I had the good fortune of being able to interview all nine of the city managers, in addition to some really accomplished and experienced professionals in a government-funded uh, entity, a nonprofit, a tribal community, and also someone from the private sector. And so when we took a look at the years of experience, if we focused just on the city managers, we had on average about 29 years of experience in that field. In terms of education, you had several individuals with doctoral degrees, two CPAs, multiple master's degrees. And so the people who were interviewed for the study, not only are they, they capable and competent professionals, very well educated, but they really were connected to the community. One of the other interesting things about city managers is the fact that they work with very closely with each of their five council members. So they understand those needs and the priorities and the wants of the council. And as the city manager, they're responsible for implementing those goals through the city staff. And that city staff can be anywhere from 50 people up to 300 people. And also something unique about city managers, this is they actually interact with the community. They interact with their, their actual residents. So that was the thinking behind who was interviewed. Let's briefly talk about some of my early assumptions. Again, I was a student of the economy. And so what did I go into this study thinking? First of all, I thought that Coachella Valley was a more or less a stable economy, although I felt it was a shallow economy. I felt that there were uh, equitable opportunities for all residents. And I also felt that the economic trends were improving. I have to say, when I dove into chapter one, 
and spent the vast amount of time doing all of the research to really understand the valley. I was deeply troubled. I found that there was significant inequity valley-wide. There was limited upward economic mobility. And that economic conditions were becoming more challenging for our most vulnerable. Thankfully, there was a silver lining. And that was, I felt that there was the significant potential for positive change through intentional, strategic, and properly funded regional action. So let's dive into what I actually uncovered in the research. I uncovered, as I alluded to before, that Valley residents are hurting. 19.9% of Valley residents live at or below 100% of the federal poverty limit. So what is that number? So that means if you are a person in, in a household, one individual, that means you're making per year less than $12,500. If you are a family of four, you are somehow expected to get by by an income of less than $26,000 per year. And that's for food, clothing, transportation, housing. If we took a look at the bigger picture, we, took a look at, we would find that 44.5%, or really I just think of as almost 50% of our population is living at or below double the federal poverty limit. Another way to say that is 200% of the federal poverty limit. And in my graph that you see here, for a single person household, 200% of the federal poverty limit is just under $25,000. And a household of four at 200% or below the federal poverty limit is more or less just under $52,000 annual income. So let's put that in perspective because that federal poverty limit is those are numbers, those are incomes that are established throughout the continental United States. This does not include Alaska, that does not include Hawaii, but the continental United States. So then I ask kind of a more troubling or a deeper question. Understanding that the state of California has the highest overall energy cost in the continental United States. We have some of the highest cost of residential real estate, state tax, California is a very expensive place to live. So if you're living at 200% of the federal poverty limit, that's the same number that someone would receive if they were earn, if they were living in Texas or the Southeast United States or the Midwest. And I would propose that that $52,000 for four people does not go nearly as far as in other places in the United States. What does that mean? that it's even harder to get by at, at the federal poverty limit or below the federal poverty limit in California. So this was an interesting chart. And this shows that this, these, these economic issues, these poverty issues or near poverty issues are not in just one side of the valley. This is not a North Valley problem. This is not an East Valley problem. This is an All Valley problem. I also found that the higher paying, higher skilled jobs within the Coachella Valley are leaving the valley. And in, and in turn or in place, there is a small increase in the lower paying, lower skilled jobs. And in the conclusion of all this, I found out that the economic trends based on my research are getting worse. So this is the chart, hopefully you can read it. We'll take a look at the top half of the chart. Those blue bars represent annual incomes. And some of those annual incomes are quite strong. You have 60,000, 56,000, 89,000, 76,000. But unfortunately, those are the jobs between 2010 and 2017 that the Coachella Valley lost. If you take a look at the bottom half of the chart, those are some of the jobs that increased in number between 2010 and 2017. And I'd call your attention 
to how much lower those annual salaries are. There are two outliers. Two outliers, one is the professional scientific technology uh, services, and then also the uh, manufacturing. Those both have respectable annual salaries, and they are skewing that black trend line that you see, I think, unnecessarily or unfairly to the positive. Because when you take a look at the percentage change within those two high paying areas, it was a very small change that occurred over the course of seven years. So what does this mean? That that trend line, that downward trend line is even more so if you were to take those two outliers out. So let's continue with what the research uncovered. The research uncovered that the Coachella Valley economy is a fragile economy, and it's fragile based on the fact that it's based on discretionary purchases of luxury items. Because as we know, tourism, as much as we enjoy it, is a luxury good. When we take a look at the, the largest industries within our valley, there is a clear standout, and that is the tourism industry. Scott White and the team at the Greater Coachella Valley Visitor and Convention Bureau have done an incredible job of building up the robustness, the comprehensiveness, the health of our destination. And as a consequence, we are now at $7.5 billion a year, both direct spending and indirect spending, that comes from tourism. Our next largest industry within the valley is agriculture. And agriculture purchase, produces just under $1 billion a year for our economy. The third largest industry within our valley was actually difficult to understand. I wasn't quite sure, was it possibly K through eight, K through 12 education system? Was it healthcare? Was it the local government? And this brings up a really important point, And that is the difference between a traded sector economy and a non-traded sector economy. So if we look at a non-traded sector business, what would, what would be a good example of that? That might be a restaurant or dry cleaner. Those are two types of entities that are a uh, very important part of, our, of any, really, any community. But if an employee finishes college, a dry cleaner or a restaurant owner cannot necessarily offer them more money. There is limited upward economic mobility. If we take a look at the opposite end of the spectrum, and that is the traded sector economy, think of what Microsoft did for Redmond, Washington in the early 80s. Redmond, Washington was a sleepy timber town. Microsoft moved in, and they began to create a, a build a, pro a product that was sold throughout the world. And those sales, that, those revenues came back to Redmond, Washington. And as a result, that city experienced incredible growth. And that's one of the key differences between a traded sector, bringing in, making sales to outside of a region and bringing in wealth into the region that they're based, versus a non-traded sector, which really circulates the money that's already in the economy. Both are absolutely critical, but it's the traded sector that gives upward economic mobility or greater opportunities for the upward economic mobility. It values education and in fact rewards advanced education. So I was having dinner the other night and I was jokingly, uh, jokingly said that in our economy, Coachella Valley, we have three major exports. Our first one is Instagram. A lot of photos, a lot of great memories. We do a great job with that because this is a beautiful place to live, beautiful place to vacation. Our next largest export is agriculture. And our third is our youth. And this is concerning. So if our youth grow up here and they wanna to go to college and they wanna have that upward economic mobility, chances are they're gonna to have to leave the valley. And once they get their education, they get their AA or their uh, four-year degree, or they go on to a master's or higher, oftentimes they may not be able to come back to the Coachella Valley because we don't have the diversity of our core industries. So essentially we have a situation where our best and brightest are forced to leave the valley if they wanna have a better life. 
Thankfully, the research proved out that we have a, some pretty big opportunities, and that comes from the agreement within the community leaders. And this, so right now, we're gonna dive into chapter four. So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to con combine about 90 categories onto one slide. And so this is just kind of a high level overview. But what was so amazing about this was the fact that was the agreement between the people interviewed. So what I did was my interview protocol consisted of 18 questions. I asked those 18 questions of 13 people. Now, of those 18 questions, eight of those were completely open-ended. What does economic development mean to you? Another question was, how do you influence economic development in your organization? And so those interviewees received no prompting from me at all, but was absolutely amazing. And what, 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 what shows tremendous promise for our valley was the agreement between virtually all of the different leaders. So I've come up with this question, what do Indian Wells, Desert Hot Springs, and a tribe have in common? When we take a look at the core function the, the demographic, demographics of each of those organizations, they're vastly different. The, the, the needs, the location, the community members within Indy Wells are very different than that of Desert Hot Springs. And Desert Hot Springs is very different than uh, any one of the tribal nations. But what was so heartening, what was so encouraging, was the congruence and the responses between each of the professionals that ran those organizations that I interviewed. It was incredibly touching to hear professionals from some of the, the, the wealthier cities in the valley. They voiced the same concern about the most vulnerable members of the population that the leaders from some of the communities with the highest percentage of vulnerable populations. So what I'm saying is, is there was tremendous agreement within our leaders. And with agreement can come the opportunity for collaboration. So let's quickly dive into that a little bit. 100% of the people interviewed believe that economic development is achieved through proactive and intentional action. Virtually all of the leaders voluntarily articulated completely on their own. They believe that through economic development, you can improve both the economy and the socioeconomic conditions. That's how powerful economic development is. All of the respondents felt that collaboration amongst the cities and a strategic approach, a true strategy and a holistic approach is mission critical to success. And lastly, 85% voluntarily articulated that they felt that CVEP is critical. CVEP, the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership is critical for facilitating regional economic development. That is the one organization whose only goal is to prove the Coachella Valley economy. Some other points, and again, these are just a few pulled out from about 90 categories that I identified through the research. Healthcare really bubbled up as a major potential. And this builds on many things, but this builds on how do we, how do we build on existing momentum. As we know, as we age, we begin to consume more medical services. So here, we've already got a very strong medical community. We've got three hospitals. We've got four, if you consider high desert. And you've got a number of practices and some, some fantastic specialties. How do we build that? How do we strengthen that? That is a traded sector job that rewards education. And in fact, our medical care goes up as we get more highly educated and highly experienced professionals to move into our valley. One of the other things that was also deeply concerning, but also was heartening to see how our leaders understood that due to the limited economic and educational opportunities within our valley, that was causing lifelong harm and inequity. And I think this last bullet point is very relevant in a few slides. So this represents chapter five. 
This is a bit much to take in. Hopefully you can see it. But one of the things that I found personally astounding about using this grounded theory research method was when I took a look at the entire set of data, all of the interview results, all 234 responses, and I started parsing through what they said, how they said it, what were the words, how did that relate to what they previously said, what was their overall message. I found out that 15 categories emerged from all 13 interviewees. And within those 15 categories, they fell into four major themes. For our discussion here today, I've only focused on two of those, and that is the critical needs and our future goals. So let's just review that real quick. Critical needs, and that is that we need as a valley, we need to tear down the silos, and we need to be making complementary policy decisions. Because when someone comes from outside of the community, they don't see the Palm Springs and the Cathedral City and the Rancho Mirage, they see us as one giant community. So we, it, is, we, it is in our best interest to have complementary policy decisions that go across all 400, 410 square miles. We need to diversify our core industries. We need to collaborate regionally. And we need strategic planning and action. Our future goals. The Coachella Valley is the beautiful place it is today because we have built on tourism over the last 80 years. It has done wonderful things for the valley. We've got wonderful amenities because of tourism, and we need to continue to maintain the strength of our tourism. We need to diversify, but diversification does not mean abandonment. We need to build on existing momentum. And if anyone is familiar with John Cotter, we need to grab the short-term wins as we pursue those long-term goals. So where do we go from here? Heaven forbid one of us were ever to develop a major illness. I hope it doesn't happen in our lifetimes, but unfortunately it often will. And one of the things, if you did receive that diagnosis from the doctor, I bet you and your family and your medical team, you would want them to immediately focus on identifying and separating what is the problem versus the symptom of the problem. And that's one of the things that I think we need to do here. We need to proactively and very assertively go after solving the problem. The best cures, if focused on symptoms only, do nothing to address the problem that's causing the symptoms. And in fact, I believe if we focus our energy and our limited resources on treating symptoms, that that's going to allow the problem to fester and become worse. So I really see us as having two paths from this point. The first path is a wait and see approach. I called it the Band-Aid and Hope approach. Let's continue to do what we've always done and, and hope and pray for different results. I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they felt, hey, you know, let's just, in 20 years, things will be different. Let's just wait and see. And if you can think back to a few slides ago and how the professionals who are in touch with virtually all of, collectively, the residents within the Coachella Valley, what was their feedback? We have got economic and social harm that's lifelong and debilitating with our current environment. So personally, based on my training and experience, as a director of economic development for an excellent city here within the Valley, very competent city council and city manager, and also based on the five years of this doctoral journey, I believe that we need to have focused action to create positive change. I think that consists of three things. It consists of intentional, collaborative, and strategic action. Let's focus on that key word, action. I'm not talking about really fancy studies that cost a lot of money that sit on a shelf and take no action, that are never done with. We've certainly seen that occur over the years. I'm talking about that intentional, collaborative, and strategic action. And that word action requires something. That requires consistent and sustainable tax-based funding. So what exactly does that mean? There are three entities within the Coachella Valley 
that do an excellent job with their respective mission, missions. That's the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, or CVAG. That's Sunline Transportation. And that is the Greater Palm, Palm Springs Visitor and Conventioner Bureau, which I believe has recently renamed itself to Visit Palm Springs. These are three organizations led by capable, experienced, well-educated folks. They have amassed a team of similarly capable professionals, and they do a great job of achieving their mission. Sunline is, a, is continually accomplishing something that you would think would, would come from a region four times our size. And what, are those, what do those organizations have? The, what do they have in common, aside from capable and competent leaders and a dedicated team that work hard? They have consistent funding. And that funding allows for certain things. That funding allows for the hiring of capable and competent people it also allows for the actual execution of the mission. So my last, my last suggestion here, and that is, is our elected officials. Based on my travels over the years, and I've lived all over the United States, I believe the Coachella Valley is blessed. We have a very unique group of elected officials. They are capable, they are competent, they are bright, and they care about our community. And I think as a constituency, each one of us have a duty and an obligation to reach out to those elected officials and let them know how important regional economic development is. Intentional, strategic, collaborative, and funded regional economic development. And I would suggest that that action needs to begin today. And if you need a reason to begin that action today, I would ask you to recall 50, almost 50% 50 of our population are suffering, are struggling to get by, because they don't have the economic opportunities that come with a more stable and more robust and a more year-round economy. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Stone. Now, I'd like to share with you some background on our next speakers, Dr. Mike Stoll and Ezekiel Bonias. Dr. Mike Stoll is the director of the Inland Empire Center for Entrepreneurship at California State University, San Bernardino. He also serves as the director of the School of Entrepreneurship in the Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration, the first and only school of its kind in California. Dr. Stoll holds a BA and MBA in business from CSUSB and a doctorate in management from Case Western Reserve University. Ezekiel Bonias is an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship and strategy at CSUSB's School of Entrepreneurship. He is a Doctor of Management candidate at Case Western Reserve University and a Fowler Center Fellow at Case Western's Weatherhead School of Management. He was recently awarded with the Outstanding Lecturer Award for 2020-2021 at the Jack H. Brown College of Business and Public Administration. Please welcome Dr. Mike Stoll and Ezekiel Bonias. Thank you, Laura. We're super excited, Zeke and I, to be here this you know, to present what we're calling the state of entrepreneurship and the School of Entrepreneurship at Cal State San Bernardino and the Illinois Empire Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, Zeke and I were part of a research team that put together this state of entrepreneurship report. We're going to talk a little bit about that report in its totality, and then we're going to drill down into what we really found out about what's happening in the Coachella Valley when it comes to entrepreneurship and small business. And we'll try and give you as much of the insight that we were able to glean from the business owners that participated in this survey. But I wanna start with kind of setting a context just to give you a little bit of a teaser. Um, not necessarily part of our big report, but the idea that um, entrepreneurship and small business is critical to the economic growth of a region. And you heard a lot of interesting thing, things in Stone's presentation, now, like we were taking notes, you know, and uh, that, that I think some of the things that we're going to talk about today really kind of play into some of those things that he was speaking about. And um, one thing that I want to note is that over the last 12 months, we've had over 4,000 businesses um, that have started in the Coachella Valley. And um, I don't want to get into the specifics, but the nice thing, the interesting thing is, 
there's no real preponderance of where those businesses are launching. It's pretty evenly spread across the valley. And so despite the fact that we were in a really difficult time, you know, really the last two years, but the, the last year as well, we're still seeing businesses created and, and started. So, you know. Yeah, and it, and it goes with the old uh, saying, you know, that a lot of times many people uh, during economic downturns uh, tend to start businesses uh, during uh, downturns, during recessions. Absolutely counterintuitive. We saw that in the, in the last economic recession, people would ask me, because they know what I do for a living, and they would ask me, you know, Mike, you, are, is this really affecting startups? And I said, yes, it is. And they said, that's too bad. And I said, no, it's not too bad. They're actually increasing because people are now finding economic opportunity. They're being forced to in many cases. Um, and entrepreneurship, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, is really economic empowerment. And that ties in a lot to what Stone was talking about in terms of income and inequities. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so let's, let's drill down a little bit into what we did with this State of Entrepreneurship Report. Now, I'll preface it by saying this is the first comprehensive look at entrepreneurship in Riverside, San Bernardino, and portions of Los Angeles County that's ever been done. And so it was a big project. Um, which we're kind of coming to the end of, and we're giving just a little bit of a teaser today on what we've learned in that report. There's gonna be more aspects to the report, but we're sharing what's called the voice of the entrepreneur. Um, and that to me is super important when we're crafting policies, when we're thinking about economic development, when we're thinking about the future, we have to include the voice of the key stakeholders that are part of driving that future. You know, Zeke, there's nobody, as important as entrepreneurs in an ecosystem, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, entrepreneurs, they bring these sort of creative ideas uh, into the way we do things. They challenge the status quo. And you know, the interesting thing about this recession is that out of uh, entrepreneurship was born out of necessity. Uh, you know, and I think that a lot of times people think that we can just do it because it's a choice. And there are some folks that do it by choice, but when you have nothing else, uh, no, nowhere else to go, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right we, we uh, tend to put our creativity to use. Yeah, so the voice of the entrepreneur, the people that are creating businesses, they're running businesses, growing businesses in the region, it's really, really important to understand what are they experiencing, what's, what challenges are they facing, what opportunities do they see? So we really wanted to drill down and do that. Zeke and I were part of a research team that put together a survey, and we sent that out to a, a really wide range of business owners throughout the, the general Inland Empire region, including Coachella Valley. And we received over 1,400 responses. Of, of that, about 1,000, a little over 1,000 were usable. In other words, they had enough, enough data that they submitted that we could, we could glean some insight from them. And then we, we, when we really drilled down to the Coachella Valley, we got down to 75 distinct usable responses. And what we want to share now is some of those insights. What is that voice of the entrepreneur telling us and really telling us what needs to be maybe actionable steps um, that need to happen in the region for us to really thrive and grow. And I will preface it before we share the results to say that you know as I was going through um, all of the responses and kind of looking at some of the qualitative information they gave us, um, and we get we left them at the very as you know at the very end of the survey we left them they open the box and says is there any anything else you want to tell us about your experience beyond what we've already asked. And a lot of the responses were, thank you for asking us what our experience is. Thank you for caring enough about us as business owners to want to know what we're facing and giving us an outlet to share some of our frustrations and some of our excitement for future opportunities. So as we share these um, results, you know, put it in the context that there was a real hunger for these business owners to really want to be heard. Um, and that was kind of a, a nice byproduct of doing it. You know, I think just on that note, Mike, one of the interesting things that as entrepreneurs, uh, when you're running a company, you're wearing many different hats. You have to lead, you have to manage, you have to be whatever you are, whether you're a father or a mother at home. And a lot of times it just gets overwhelming. So to have something like this is sort of that healthy outlet for them to really voice, these are some of the top issues, this is my point of view. I think they really appreciate it. And, and we had just as much fun analyzing the data, having those, yeah. these sort of conversations, uh, and really engaging with this uh, unique breed of, of of individuals, uh, a unique breed of leaders out here yeah, in the desert. Absolutely. So when we when we did the Voice of the Entrepreneur survey, what did we want? To, what did we want to know? What kind of questions did we ask? 
And we actually spent a lot of time constructing the, the questions, going through as a group, and um, consulting with uh, kind of a, a hand-picked group of entrepreneurs throughout the region that gave us feedback and told us these are the kind of things that we would like to share. So we came down um, and we had, we, as Zeke knows, we started with a really long survey and we had to get it down to a manageable point. But um, what we wanted to know um, among many things was what, what were the effects of the lockdown? What, what were the effects of the COVID pandemic on your business? What's the current status of your business? How are you doing now? Um, what were the difficulties that you faced to, you know, running the business um, over the last 12 to 24 months? Um, you know, we were curious as to how they got started. You know, how do they fund the business and um, whether the business was their actual, their, their primary source of income or whether it was a side, a side gig or a, a right. side hustle is what we, what we would typically call it now. Um, we also want to know what were the most significant challenges they faced just in general um, for the business, but also as an entrepreneur. What were those personal challenges they faced? And, um, you know, we were also curious because what, one of the things that came out in our kind of our pre-testing with the entrepreneurs was this idea that they, there's a kind of a pent up frustration with, uh, I'll just use a generic term, government, right? policymakers and uh, perhaps a perceived lack of support for business. Um, and then we also wanted to know about, you know, how did they access capital? Did they have challenges accessing? Because we hear that all the time access to capital, access to capital, but you know, is it real? Is it, is right. it one of the top issues that they face, right? So we really wanted to know that. And we also wanted to know what could the public sector do to help them? You know, if, if they could wave a, a magic wand or you know, get a genie's wish, you know, what, would they, what would they want out of that? So um, some really interesting you know, questions that we asked. Um, the people that responded, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of context. I'm gonna focus on uh, Coachella Valley. Um, we're seeing the increasing number of female entrepreneurs and the preponderance in this response to this, this uh, survey. Um, and re remember, it's a small slice, it's a snapshot, so, uh, uh, but it was 53% female um, and relatively old, older uh, in relation to our larger sample which was a little bit younger in terms of age, median age 50, 45. So a little more seasoned, a little more right. experienced. And I think that was an interesting find because a lot of times, you know, if you look at much, much of the media, we tend to focus on these sort of younger yes. success stories, right? And what we don't realize is the fact that, you know, it does take experience, it does take people uh, having a, accumulated capital over the, over the years to then put an idea to, to, to use, to develop that sort of social capital, right? Develop a, a good network of people that could be possible clients. So it does take time. And I think this was really interesting to just see this in our survey that the median age of respondents was 45. Yeah, yeah, this, and this kind of mirrors, as you said, there's a preconception that um, entrepreneurs are, you know, fresh out of college and, but generally, uh, the sweet spot for starting a business is in your late 30s or early 40s. We see that from research. This kind of reinforces it that, you know, um, and it's funny, too, because this lines up with another statistic I'm going to give, which is the most of the businesses in this response that we received from Coachella Valley owners um, had been in business about 10 years. So 45, 35, right? right, right that right. sweet spot for starting a business. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the demographics, um, you know, for, out of this sample for Coachella Valley, 53% uh, identified uh, their ethnicity as white, 30% um, Hispanic, 77% um, 77 of them uh, identified that this was their primary source of income. So over three quarters of the, the respondents. Um, interestingly, about um, not quite half, first time as an entrepreneur. So they right. hadn't had multiple businesses. This, is, this was their first go around. And nearly all of them were either the founder or co-founder. There, there's a small subset that um, they don't technically consider themselves a founder because they either purchased the business or it's a franchise opportunity or something right. like that. So, but it, largely these were self-driven, self-motivated um, startups. Um, not surprisingly, um, the preponderance of the respondents said that their, their business type was either retail or service focused, which you would you would expect to see quite a bit of that. And it does go with the previous economic reports that we've yeah. seen for this region that you know a big driver of the economy is tourism, right? And so you, you definitely see those sort of businesses uh, that that feed into that industry, which is retail yeah. um, and service industries. Yeah. And it kind of matches us. It matches some of the census data we have on the region in terms of um, business types. So it's it's pretty pretty closely aligned as a sample. Um, going further, and I just mentioned it, you know, nearly half of them have been in business 10, 10 or more years. So again, that's, it's kind of lining up with what we, 
we, what we know about entrepreneurs being kind of in the 30s and 40s when they start versus kind of right out of college. Although we right. want to, you know, we want to increase that type of activity as well. Um, in the, the larger sample of the survey that we did, um, the Coachella Valley business owners had fewer employees mm. uh, than mm. the business, their peers in the other regions. Um, but the one thing that was interesting is they lost fewer employees during the pandemic than the rest of our, it was about half actually, um, uh, in terms of looking at. So that was kind of interesting that they, they have fewer employees, but they lost fewer employees as right. well. Um, yeah, yeah, which is interesting. You know, I think uh, from, there's, there's lots of data and lots of research, right? But there's this old adage that says, hire slowly, fire quickly, right? And, I, and we kind of see this sort of hesitancy from uh, Coachella Valley business owners to hire um, and to have more employees. It could be a number of factors. It could yeah. be the, the um, uh, the economy here is a little more uh, specialized than in other industries, um, and uh, we don't have access to larger markets yeah. such as LA or San Diego as the inland region would. Wow. So there's a number of factors there that could uh, definitely impact that. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna touch on that a little bit because there's some other findings that I think tie to that. Um, they did report loss of revenue at a higher rate than our larger sample, um, which covered all of Riverside, San Bernardino, and parts of Los Angeles County. So um, they did lo they lost fewer employees, um, and, but they did lose more revenue. So it'd be interesting if we have time to unpack that. We may not have time, uh, but in the, the larger report, we will. Um, interestingly enough, and probably per not, perhaps not surprisingly enough, Zeke, 90% um, of the respondents were one million or less in revenue. So the truly kind of smaller, smaller businesses. Um, and most of these folks were driven by you know, what we see quite often with entrepreneurs. They want to be their own boss. They want to have the freedom to kind of cut their own path. And that's very consistent here. Um, I, one of the things that was really inspiring for me out of this um, response was that nearly all of them were able to stay in business during this period of time. 91% of the respondents in this, this particular survey, um, specifically Coachella Valley, were able to keep operating and survive the pandemic. And so, um, yeah, and, and I think it's really interesting, you know, this, this, there's, again, there's this misconception about businesses, you know, most of the time when we think of companies or folks that have their businesses, we tend to t think of the success stories. Yeah. Those that have uh, businesses that are over a million dollars in sales or we call scalable businesses. Yeah. And here we have a, a lot of mom and pop shops which don't, don't necessarily get to that point. And again, yeah. uh, I think this ties into some of the COVID results that yeah. those businesses that are not scale, that have less than half a million dollars in sales, tend to get hit a lot harder. Uh, with economic downturns or the shutdowns that we so had in, in that, COVID. It's that liability of smallness that we talk about. Yeah. Um, and it also has some implications, which we'll touch on in a moment, um, for um, the, the businesses being smaller might be driven by some things we learned from them. And we're, we're gonna talk about that. Um, on, the, on the positive, um, building on that positive of mo many, most of them, you know, riding out that pandemic, they're more about half of the businesses really are planning to add more people in 2022. They see it, they see the coming things coming back, they're optimistic, so yeah. that's and I think a good thing. One interesting thing that, um, that I think about when I meet with clients, especially folks who had larger companies and that were really hurt uh, from the last downturn, is that the lessons from that uh, last recession yeah. is that they were a lot more nimble. And despite the sort of growth that they had pre-COVID, st you still saw some of that hesitancy play out in a lot of small businesses. Uh, and, and again, that could yeah. have been something that may have uh, saved them from having to shut down, uh, despite the, having lost um, the half of their sales right. uh, during yeah. the uh, recession. Yeah, yeah, they they'd, they'd built a kind of a resilience that that you know only um, making it through other economic downturns prepares you for. So, um, and again, on the upswing, you know, um, a majority of the business owners <clears throat> believe that they are going to have higher revenue in 2022. And um, so they're, they're optimist, cautiously optimistic, right. I think is the way to say it. Which you it. definitely need when you're you, an entrepreneur. You definitely have to. Um, what was interesting was, um, and this was you know, something that um, I think goes a little bit, people think, oh, well, starting a business, you have to go out and get other people's money. And 85% of our, our respondents in this said, um, in the Coachella Valley, said they use personal funds as their primary source of funding, and they needed less than 20, you know, half, more than half of them said, we only needed less than you know, $25,000 or less to get this business off the ground. Right, right. So, um, and, they, and they said, you know, really, it's hard to get external investment. Right, 
You know, and again, my, my background as a former banker, you know, I think it was one of those things that we'd, we'd see this constantly. People yeah. have this misconception that they can come to a bank and ask for money. But, you know, banks really look at risk, right? And yeah. when you have a new startup which has no history, uh, it's really difficult to assess that sort of risk. And so you see these sort of banks being hesitant. Um, and so, again, I, I, this goes to show how entrepreneurs are very creative yeah. and very resilient. They find these creative workarounds. Yeah. Uh, and so they tend to be smaller and more nimble. And, and, and again, $25,000 is not a lot of money. Um, I think we have this misconception. I think too many of us yes. are watching Shark Tank. Yes. Thinking that folks need a, a half Thanks. a million yes. or, or yeah. more, right? Yeah, the, the, the barriers to entry are relatively low for a lot of businesses. And so people get this, this stuck in this idea that, oh, I have to have, yes. Three hundred, five hundred thousand um, dollars, and yeah, in some businesses that may take that, but in many businesses you can. The price of entry can be less than twenty-five thousand dollars. So, um, I think that's a really interesting um, point. Um, when we ask them about their challenges, like what is the challenge that their business is facing, um, you know, obviously high atop the list, shocking, um, right. you know, the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, right? Um, but then the next most significant finding was they said finding talent is the hardest part you know really getting employees um and not just getting employees getting the right employees correct that, with the right <clears throat> skill set and and the right approach um also high on that list government regulation red tape um obstacles to growth um then re obviously related to the coronavirus pandemic is the supply chain challenges um and then, you know, important, but far down the list in their mind was access to capital. Right. You know, now I will say that when we take a look at this sample for Coachella Valley and we drill down into what we would call underrepresented minorities, access to capital now rises to the top and cash flow and access to capital becomes the most important thing. But when we also look at that sample, uh, we then see that the business is younger and s even smaller than the, the, you know, up to a million. They become uh, generally under 400,000. So yeah, depending on the size and the age of the business, the issues might be a little bit different. And right. for a lot of, and we're gonna talk about the growth of businesses and some of those issues. Um, so just you know, when, when you look at the, what we've been through the last 24 months, this is the kind of things that the business owners are facing. These were their top challenges. Yeah, and I think what was interesting is this, a lot of folks uh, answered coronavirus, right? The, the results of the pandemic, but we don't know, we didn't necessarily get a chance to, to distinguish, was it the results of that? You know, right. like supply uh, chain disruptions, yeah. Yeah. Uh, finding talent and all the unemployment, it, uh, yeah. Or was it uh, the, the increased government regulation for public health? Um, and again, that's really interesting to uh, be able to break that down further. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of quickly move through this. When, we, when they talked about their personal challenges, time management, being able to manage their schedule, working way too many hours because they have to do so many things, managing the stress that comes with that. Um, you know, finding time for a social life, saying no, you know, that's always a hard thing for entrepreneurs to say no. Um, probably the most interesting takeaway from their personal challenges was what we called self-doubt. They have doubt in their abilities to be successful as an entrepreneur. And it was, it came up in our larger sample, but it was significantly higher in the Coachella Valley group. Um, and so, yeah, and I, and I find that it really relatively interesting. Much like uh, Dr. Stone, who came before us, uh, I'm working on my own uh, doctorate degree, and my research happens to, to focus on underrepresented minorities and seeing this sort of lack of community that you sometimes see within this uh, demographic as business owners, not necessarily culturally, but as business owners. And when f people feel less connected, uh, they tend to feel the sort of implications yeah. of stress a lot more and don't make the sort of uh, clear-headed decisions that one that is uh, socially connected and has yeah. a nice support network yeah. to help navigate the many challenges that uh, entrepreneurs have to face. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because, you know, it, it comes up often and this, this survey kind of reinforced it that, that uh, entrepreneurs kind of feel like they don't get a lot of support from the, the um, public sector, policymakers. Um, and um, so this, you know, that, that comes up anecdotally and this, this really reinforced it that um, they, they feel like there maybe more needs to be done and have a better understanding um, from a policy perspective on what they are experiencing and how you can help facilitate the growth 
of small companies. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because we kind of often hear it, but it just was reinforced in the survey that, that that's an important part of it. Um, and you know, on a positive note, despite all the challenges they've been through, almost all of them said they would start a business again and nearly half said they would recommend to their friends and family, Let, this is a great pathway, it's a great thing to do. Um, and then when they had that outlet where they needed to talk about their business, they generally talked to their peers. Um, so they wanted to talk to somebody that was going through a similar situation as to they were. So I thought that was an interesting finding. Um, we did ask them you know, whether they had ever thought about moving outside of California, and many of them have, and the reasons why is what we hear time and time again, cost of doing business, taxes, regulatory environment. The one positive um, that the, the region has is the lifestyle. It's a key strength. It was pointed out by the participants that one of the reasons why they don't leave the Coachella Valley, um, at least with the, as a business owner, not as a youth, which Stone was talking about, uh, is that the lifestyle is a key right. consideration, that they, they didn't see a lifestyle in another state as better than what they have here. And um, if they felt like, uh, more than half of them felt like if they had to, absolutely had to make a decision that they had to be more competitive, they'd consider moving out of California. So uh, some significant implications there. Uh, so let's really briefly, let's talk about a couple of key tidbits that we, we were talking about as we read through the results. Um, and I want to go back, if, and we may not get to all of these in, in detail, but let's talk a little bit about that self-doubt piece, Zeke. Right, right. right. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, uh, when I look at, at uh, the way entrepreneurs navigate this whole landscape, right, uh, there is just, as I mentioned earlier, there's many hats that we have to wear, right? We have to manage employees, you have to manage customer yeah. relationships, you have to manage a regulatory environment. And that can be very, I mean, incredibly overwhelming. We see it with the data, right? Time management, stress, saying no, yeah. delegating, those are all things that happen. So what happens when we feel the stress is we tend to kind of isolate ourselves. And so what I'm looking at, the difference is between those that have scaled their firms, yeah basically have, have reached over a million versus those that have yet to scale their firms. Those with scaled firms tend to be more connected. They tend to be more involved in the community. They tend to be a part of larger peer networks of fellow entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, and, and that, that's a really key uh, distinction. Yes, they've, they've found a way um, to connect with peers that help them work through that self-doubt. Plus, they now have a connection of peers that have knowledge based and that's one of the things that we talked about is like, you know, one of the assumptions that we make um, that we kind of believe is happening is that people do reach out to their peers, but they don't have that many peers to reach out to. Correct. There's no formal network. There's no formal connection. It's one of the initiatives we're working on in the Center for Entrepreneurship is creating a peer entrepreneur peer network program. That is, and so instead of them having a, a couple of people that they talk to, now they'll have 10 to 15 that they regularly talk to and meet. And that right. we think that deals with the connectedness piece, but it also deals with the self-doubt piece because you get into a room and you find out everybody has that self-doubt. Everyone has it. And how to, and then you have coping strategies. So we think right. that's a really, really important thing. And um, what we have found also with those that are scaled firms is that they do have net, uh, a network of mentors, yes. right? And again, this, this yeah. kind of overlaps with the peer network, but to be able to have someone to talk to that has been through it before, someone that has navigated those challenges. They may have not navigated the pandemic, but they have navigated challenges where, where you know, we think of 2008 when the, with the housing yeah. market crash, yeah. right? Um, those lessons uh, can be shared uh, with, with younger entrepreneurs. Yes. And I think that's a very valuable, um, that's a very valuable trait that, that we can uh, yeah. really take away. So I think that is, 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 if there's anything to take away, when we, you look at these smaller entrepreneurs, these mom and pop shops, it's definitely an opportunity to learn from that, get them connected. And, uh, and I think we see communities that are, that are more connected yeah. um, that tend to, to thrive economically. So that's, and that's one of the things that we, you know, at the Center for Entrepreneurship and the School of Entrepreneurship, we want to be a catalyst for driving, making those connections, creating programs that connect entrepreneurs in the region so that they can help you know, it's not, you know, the, the key is getting them connected so they can help each other grow. Not necessarily us helping them grow, but they can grow as a group. And so, um, and that's kind of how can, that, that ties into the regulation piece. How can policymakers be a catalyst? A lot of it is convening and understanding the needs and then getting out of the way, right? right. Um, and I think CVEP is particularly well positioned to be that kind of a catalyst working with organizations like ours to really be a change maker in the, in the region and also be able to bring that voice 
of the entrepreneur to the policymaker so that they have a better understanding and, and bridging that gap. Right, and I, I think just an easy example is the city of Palm Desert and their support for the, not only for Cal State, but also for the uh, Innovation Hub. Yes. Right, now we host uh, courses of entrepreneurship and I'm getting students that, that want it, that have their own micro businesses or side hustles and we have this opportunity to connect them with new mentors, other people who have uh, sort of navigated this sort of uh, yeah. environment uh, of, of being an entrepreneur and yeah. now they can share that knowledge and so, you just see this amazing uh, learning occur in just a short yeah. period of time. Yeah, I mean, and that goes back to the, you know, keeping our talent here. Part of it is the talent having opportunities to create their own businesses and grow their own businesses, which will create good jobs in the region. And so I think that, you know, finding talent, now yeah, that's clearly an issue um, that um, from the owner, business owner's perspective, there has to be a lot more skilled labor, and so the talent pool has to grow here. So that's, again, a policy issue. It's also an educational right. issue. Um, and then access to capital, because it comes up all the time. Um, I think particularly for, for uh, minority-owned firms, the access to capital I issue is more pressing. And so what can we as a region do to start facilitating uh, more vehicles for providing support to early stage companies and small businesses that that will provide that that fuel to help them grow. Right, right. So, and as well as you know, one of the things we found in the pandemic was that a lot of businesses, smaller ones and particularly minority businesses, were shut out of some of the government support in terms of like the payroll loan, the idle loans, and uh, that because they weren't financially ready with their accounting, their financial statements, their their uh, ability to navigate that part of the business was lacking and they got kind of left behind. And so we've created a program, kind of a financial, small business financial fitness program that is gonna, the next time this happens, they're gonna be ready. Right, right. And, it, it, and again, it goes back to the findings from earlier, right? Those that are larger firms, those that are scaled, they tend to have a network already yes, of people that, exactly. that understand the system. They have a network of bankers, yeah. of CPAs, of professionals yeah. that they can get this knowledge at first hand. When you are a smaller entrepreneur and you just feel a little bit more isolated or you have just a small group, yeah. um, and, and especially if, if you don't have a peer that has been successful, knowledge tends to be very limited. And so yeah. you almost tend to be that sort of last in line when, when the resources tend to run out, uh, right? And so I think that's, again, it goes to show why it's important to help yeah. and, and just connect more yeah. with these uh, smaller uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. So that's just a little glimpse into the state of entrepreneurship in the Coachella Valley. A huge shout out to CVEP for their incredible support uh, of this Voice of the Entrepreneur survey. And to all the business owners in the region that, that participated, uh, we really appreciate that. Your voice is important. The economic health of the region really depends on us paying attention and being cognizant of how we nurture and grow small business and support entrepreneurship in the region. So uh, this is the first of many insights I think we're gonna be sharing in the coming months and years about entrepreneurship and how we can be more strategic in supporting it. Yeah, thank you very much. My thanks to you both for your insights about the state of entrepreneurship in our region. Now, let me tell you a little about the gentleman presenting this year's Greater Palm Springs Economic Report and Forecast. Dr. Manfred Kyle is an associate professor and former chairman of the faculty at the Robert Day School of Economics and Finance at Claremont McKenna College. He is also a fellow at the Rose Institute of State and Local Government and the director of the Lowe Institute of Political Economy at Claremont McKenna. Dr. Kyle earned his PhD from the London School of Economics and now lectures in statistics, econometrics, and macroeconomics. Please welcome Dr. Manfred Kyle. Hello. Uh, for the uh, second year in a row, uh, I'm going to deliver the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership Report, uh, not live in the convention center, um, in Palm Springs, but we will do it as a recording. And hopefully next year we will be able to go back to live. Um, by the way, this is sort of a trend uh, in terms of conferences at the moment. Many of them around this time of the year were scheduled to be live, um, for example, at the Los Angeles uh, Convention Center, but then turned back into at least a hybrid. Um, for what it's worth, the largest book fair in the world is in my hometown in Frankfurt in Germany. 
And they went live, and instead of having the usual 8,000 uh, outlets there, uh, they have 2,000. So that shows you sort of how we are moving slowly ahead back into live performances. Um, the title of the story uh, that I want to present is called Red Light, Green Light, and that takes a little bit of, of explaining. So my original title was What Goes Down Must Come Up, obviously referring to the recession we went through and sort of the recovery that, that uh, we're still in. Um, and I presented that title to my research assistants and they sort of looked at me with a question mark and I said, oh, it's, it's a reference to an old song by Blood, Sweat and Tears called Spinning Wheels, which went, what goes up must come down. And they look at me like completely puzzled. And I said, you, you mean you don't know Blood, Sweat and Tears? And one of them says, I've never heard of them. I said, okay, take your phone, text your mother. You're not my audience, uh, but your mother might be. So text your mother and say, does she know Blood, Sweat and Tears? And I assumed that the mother would come back and say, yes, the lead singer was David Clayton Thomas and uh, he was in trouble with the US government because he was Canadian and he refused to go to Vietnam to sing and such and such. So she texts the mother and the mother texts back, no, I don't know Blood, Sweat and Tears, but your grandparents might. That was painful. Um, so after that, I've decided uh, maybe I, I don't want to uh, keep that title and I went with Red Light, Green Light. And the reason I went for the um, TV show uh, on Netflix, which by the way is number one in 29 countries, uh, is because red light means you have to stop and green light means you get to go. And that is what the economy uh, faced after February of 2020. In March of 2020, we told the economy red light and then in April we said green light. And there are some other forecasters who have described the current recession as V-shaped. They basically believe you turn off the lights, you turn the lights back on, and you're back to normal. And uh, I have always said, including last year, that maybe if you turn the lights back on, not all the lights are there. And, and with red light, green light, that's even better, because after the first game, uh, half of the contestants are dead. So red light, green light applies in many ways and in terms of also later on something I will say about the shape of the recovery, how we see it. So this is what we're going with. And I will start the presentation by looking at the national economy first, uh, then uh, at California, then the Inland Empire, and then of course what you are most interested in, the Coachella Valley. But I don't think you can understand what is going on in the Coachella Valley currently unless you got a good grasp on the national economy, uh, the state and the region. Here's something else that we've learned, uh, a title story from The Economist called Instant Economics. And what was that about? Um, there is data available at the regional level, but it is typically done with a long delay. So for example, I can get uh, gross domestic product or output uh, for the Inland Empire, um, but I cannot get it until December 9th of this year, and then it's not for 2021, it's for 2020. So you're looking at a super tanker that is going into a fog field that contains icebergs and the radar is not working, right? We really don't know what we're talking uh, about in terms of uh, up-to-date data. Um, in terms of, of, of employment data that I get from the EDD, uh, I get data that ends at the end of the first quarter in 2021. The rest I have to estimate or forecast. So what the economist uh, was saying was that there are new methods looking at credit card data, looking at uh, data that looks at revenue of small businesses, where we can make much better decisions and they will play a bigger role in the future. So that's uh, what I'm saying to you. Hopefully in the future we will be able to get uh, more data that, that directly involves uh, more recent data uh, available at the regional level. The big picture for the United States, here is GDP. The bars here are recessions. There have been 12 post-World War II recessions. 
and some of them last longer, some of them last shorter. Uh, the Great Recession you can see there it was the one from 2008 to 2009, and here's the most recent one, which of course stands out because we really shut down the economy. So the economy contracted by over 30 percent, and then it went up by more than 30 percent, but you got to be careful. The problem when you work with percentages is if you go a certain percent down and back up, you're not where you were before. So let me explain. Let's say you're holding a stock and that stock is worth $100 and it loses 50%. Where are you? It's not uh, some trick question. You're at 50. And if the stock now gains 50%, you're at 75. So you're not where you were before, right? So yes, these were big fluctuations. Um, a big shutdown, uh, something that we hadn't seen before of this magnitude, then a big comeback. But where are we now? So the people who predicted that this would be a V-shaped re recession, they would have said the path that we're following is the dotted line. So you're looking at real GDP for the United States. Uh, when it starts to turn down is the first quarter of uh, 2020. So the yellow dotted line shows you where the economy would be if it had grown at the same rate as it did from 2017 to 2019 under former President Trump. And as you can see, this is, this is not a V, right? I mean, we are far away from a V, uh, and particularly the last uh, quarter's growth that we just received now, which was the third quarter of 2021, was just 2%. And that is stunning because we had all hoped a big gain would be uh, in the books for now. Um, but for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about, uh, the economy sort of almost went into a stall, right? Um, maybe it helps to compare what the economy did with all the recessions before. So these are all post-World War II recessions. And the fat red line is the coronavirus downturn. And so you can see we have recovered the previous output, um, and that's where we are with the Fed red line. But if you compare this to all post-World War II recessions, there have only been really three, maybe four recessions where it has taken longer to get to the point where we are now. So those who would say, well, I still think the previous slide shows that you had a V-shaped uh, recession, then all post-World War II recessions, except for the Korean War, OPEC I, Volcker, and the Great Recessions, they were all V-shaped recessions. And, and I, don't, I don't think that that is true. What about unemployment? Well, unemployment mirrors sort of what happens with uh, a decline in output. If output declines by a large fraction, it's because a lot of people lose their jobs. And so here we saw unprecedented uh, increases in the unemployment rate to 15% almost for the United States. The good news is for the nation as a whole, we are now back down to 4.8%. Uh, and the the Congressional Budget Office has declared that 4.5% is full employment. Uh, before the recession, of course, we were at 3.5%, but that was an economy that was very hot. What I'm saying to you is nationwide, we're basically back to full employment. That doesn't mean that the employment level is back to where it was before, because unemployment can also fall if people drop out of the labor force. And so this here is the same graph as I've shown you for GDP, except for this time it's employment. Again, those who thought this would be a V-shaped recession, that's the dotted line, and the actual line is the red line, that's where we are. We are way off from where we were before. However, when I said this to one of the proponents of the V-shaped recovery, uh, he told me that he never meant this to count for employment. So, okay, uh, in all fairness, maybe, maybe that is true. How does this compare in terms of the recovery compared to all other previous recessions? Again, there is only one other recession, the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, uh, where it has taken longer 
to be at the point of employment recovery where we are now, right? So again, this is not something that is unusual, this recovery. It's, it's just very different from what the previous ones were with one exception. What else are we worried about these days? Uh, there, there, is, there is increasing concern about inflation. So inflation, which as you can see here from the 70s and early 80s used to be much higher, almost reached 15%. Um, typically was below 2%. And that is because the Federal Reserve had a target inflation rate of 2%. Well, that, that sort of has changed in this recession. So the latest numbers are 5.2%. And there are people who are talking about something called stagflation, which is stagnation coinciding with inflation. That is what we did observe in the late 70s. Um, but, you know, you cannot compare inflation rates of 5% with inflation rates of 15%. Uh, that's, that's just simply not uh, uh, fair. And the Federal Reserve is meeting today, and I think you will get the news that they are already adjusting some of their policies to be more restrictive uh, starting uh, uh, as of this month. So inflation is a concern, but it is of second order. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. I think this is a temporary problem. It's not a permanent problem. Typically, when I give talks like this, I don't talk about the exchange rate, um, but in the Coachella Valley, that's a different story because of the snowbirds, right? And one of the things that you can see is that the Canadian dollar with the US dollar has depreciated uh, quite a bit recently. Uh, let's go the other way around. If you look where it was in 2012, it was at a one-to-one -one exchange rate, and it went from there to $1.40. That's a 40% appreciation. Realize what that means. If you live in Alberta and you want to come to the Coachella Valley and you think you might spend $5,000 um, Canadian, then with a the new exchange rate, uh, that, that will turn into $7,000 Canadian. So it's a substantial increase. More importantly, I was asked before why it is that People perceived Canadians underbidding the housing market. And I said, well, uh, think about it. If your currency appreciates by 40%, let's say you bought a house and it's worth 300,000 US dollars. And, and to keep life simple, the value didn't change. It's at 300,000. And now you need to sell it. Well, since your dollar has appreciated by 40%, who cares if you sell it for 280,000? you're still making a huge profit, right? Taking the money back to Canada. So this matters, um, but, but at this stage, it actually works in favor of the Coachella Valley. And I think part of it is because the Canadians weren't allowed to come. So, so this will work for us. Um, in general, the situation currently can be described best as there are supply chain problems that prevent goods to come in at the rate that we want it. And the other phenomena we observe is a mismatch at the moment. There seem to be more people who are unemployed than job openings. So if you wish, um, this is sort of my attempt at humor, uh, what it will be like on, on Black Friday, right? There's a vast number of ships out there. If you go to Long Beach, uh, just stroll along the, the, the beach, you look out there and you say, wow, what are all these container ships doing out there, right? So there's a backlog at the ports of Los Angeles and, and Long Beach. You shouldn't forget that 40% of all U.S. imports, not just the ones to California, 40% of all U.S. imports come to through two ports, and that's Long Beach and Los Angeles, right? And, and that, by the way, is also the reason why the Inland Empire is doing better, because we have the warehouses to, to store the goods that come in uh, and redistribute them. Okay. What about the state economy? Uh, well, so here is California. Uh, this does not look pretty, right? So as of September 2021, that's the latest data available, uh, we have among all 50 US states uh, the highest unemployment rate. 
uh, we tie with Nevada. Uh, what's at the other extent, uh, at the other uh, extreme? You've got something like Nebraska. Nebraska has 2% unemployment. Can you believe it? Uh, South Dakota has, has less than 3%, 2.9%. Uh, but again, you have to think about this in a relative way. So how does this play out over time? And so I've chosen here the four largest US states, uh, New York, um, Texas, Florida, uh, California, and then two states that had really low unemployment rates, Nebraska and South Dakota. And to begin with, you can see over the years, there are times, there are large fluctuations. For example, Texas tends to do better when oil prices are high. They do really poorly in the mid 80s when energy prices fell by 30%. In Texas, the unemployment rate went up as you, as you can see here, right? Whereas in, on the other hand, New York and California do well in those situations. California and New York do not do well when energy prices are high. And Nebraska and South Dakota always had low unemployment rates. I don't know, they're rural states. If you lose your job, maybe you go back to the farm. I, I really don't know. But it is not that, that all of a sudden uh, these states are doing better. They have always done better uh, in general, right? And of course, their industrial composition is very different from ours. Um, South Dakota, for example, which never had a shutdown. South Dakota never shut down. But they don't really have a large leisure and hospitality industry, right? I mean, I, I, I thought maybe I, I should go to South Dakota and look what's going on. Maybe I should look at the presidents, uh, or maybe I should look at the Badlands. Uh, so I um, tried to find out if I wanted to stay in a hotel in the capital, which very few of you know uh, is called Pierre. Um, if you are in Pierre and you look for a four-star hotel, there isn't any. So uh, they're not really big on leisure and hospitality, which is the sector that hurt the most, right? So they never shut down. They have a higher mortality rate, but uh, that's, that's South Dakota for you. And here what you can see is after the coronavirus outbreak, um, California and New York have higher unemployment rates clearly than Florida and Texas. What few people know is that the mortality rates in Texas and in Florida are substantially higher. So what we have chosen in California is a path where we say, okay, um, we really don't want people to die, so we err on the conservative side and shut businesses down. Whereas Texas and Florida uh, stayed open much longer. For example, uh, Disney World has been open much longer than, than, than Disneyland, right? So it's a trade-off, and it makes people uncomfortable if you start talking about the statistical value of life, right? Because that's basically what it is. You're weighing, like the lieutenant governor in Texas did, uh, when he said, I'm willing to die for my grandparents, uh, grandchildren to, to find work, right? That's sort of talk of a statistical value of life. Um, let, me, let me tell you this. If you feel comfortable, uh, uncomfortable about this, uh, we can talk about some other U.S. policies, such as road fatalities. And in the United States, 40,000 people every year die on the road on some uh, accident, right? And I have a very simple policy to reduce that from 40,000 to zero. The simple policy is, let's put in a speed limit of five miles per hour to everyone, right? Then I promise you, no one will die in road accidents. But that's not reasonable, right? because the cost of that would be huge. And that's the sort of cost that we are looking at, what our state has uh, uh, considered versus Florida and Texas, right? We have decided that we want to shut things down to prevent loss of life, um, rather than to keep the economy going as strong as perhaps Texas and, and, uh, and, and Florida did. What about the Inland Empire? So those are the two uh, counties of Riverside and San Bernardino. Um, and here is the uh, original level of the unemployment rate. So the United States in 
February of 2020 was at 3.5%. We're now at 4.8%. At the peak, which was in April, we were at 13%. California started a little higher, went up way above that, and, and is, is still at 7.5%, right? Los Angeles, have a look at that. Los Angeles County was at 18.8%, is now at 9.7%. Why? Well, they've lost all the international business, all the international leisure, right? There are, you may not know this, um, 150 weekly flights directly from China into either SFO or LAX. That's before the crisis started. Those are basically zero, right? And you can do some back of the envelope calculations of, of what that means in terms of lost revenue. Look at um, the Inland Empire. The Inland Empire actually has done fairly well. And why is this? We're now sitting at 6.6% unemployment rates. And the reason is because we have a logistics sector. And logistics has benefited in a relative way from the shutdowns. The amount that you order through Amazon or even uh, through, through other means in terms of food and, and, and so forth uh, has just gone up immensely, right? So um, the, the Inland Empire is actually doing fairly well uh, currently, sitting at 6.6% unemployment. Certainly better than uh, Los Angeles County and certainly better than uh, California as a whole. Here's the other thing to remember. When the coronavirus recession started, the employment level for California and the United States fell below what we had experienced in July of 2007. For the Indian Empire, that wasn't the case because we had experienced an immense growth from 2010 to 2020, right? And those were not necessarily the best paying jobs, but they certainly were in sectors that uh, produced a lot of employment growth. Sometimes when you uh, look at the monthly employment data that is generated by the EDD, uh, you say, why, why is it that the Indian Empire has higher unemployment rates? It's because what you receive is the non-seasonally adjusted unemployment, the raw data, so to speak. Um, you don't want the raw data. You want the one that takes care of seasonal fluctuations. And I don't have to tell you in the Coachella Valley what it means to have seasonal fluctuations, right? You know what happens in your area in June and July uh, when the temperatures can reach 120 degrees, right? We know how, uh, how, how restaurants shut down for months and so forth and so forth, or reduce staff. So if you take care of these regular swings, then you get what is here, the orange line. And luckily at the moment, even if you believe, that, do not believe in, in the magic that I'm doing by adjusting this, at the moment the unadjusted unemployment rate and the adjusted one are the same. Let me give you a different example. In human beings, the temperature at night is always higher than during the, at, the, at the morning. That doesn't mean that you get sick during the day, right? It just means your body temperature rises. And if you want to know if you're healthy or not, you, you, you take care of those swings, right? Why did the unemployment rates increase so much? Um, well, in that initial phase from February 2020 until April, sometimes until May, it was those MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas, that had the highest share in leisure and hospitality. So here on the x-axis, I have the share of leisure and hospitality. For example, in the Inland Empire, that's a little bit less than 12%, right? In Napa Valley, it's almost 19%. And on the y-axis, the increase in the unemployment rate from February to uh, April or March. This, by the way, is useful if you think about the Coachella Valley. Think about those cities that have a high share of leisure and hospitality, right? That's not the city of Coachella, that's not Indio, but it certainly is Palm Desert and it certainly is Palm Springs, right? So those were the ones who experienced the largest increase uh, and that holds as well uh, for metropolitan statistical areas. Now here's something that I want you to take away uh, that, that many people do not tell you. 
The way to look at this recession is not V-shaped, certainly not. I used to say, think of it as swoosh, Nike swoosh, or maybe the old Verizon V, right? Goes down and then flat up. The best way to think of it is K-shaped. Why? Because in this recession, there are two types of people. There are those who made above median wages before February 2020. That's the red line here. Those people have completely recovered. It's the ones that are below the median that to this day are lacking in employment where they were before, right? Some people have referred to this recession as a she session because there are more females in leisure and hospitality than in sectors that were affected by the previous recession, namely manufacturing and construction during the Great Recession, right? So this is important. Think of it as K. And uh, uh, th that's important because, l let me tell you, uh, perhaps people who thought of this as a V-shaped recession, maybe they're just looking at the better wage earners. And if you're in the middle of the letter K, that sure looks like a V. That's not what we're looking at here. There's an entire other part, right? The people who are below here. If you wish, you can go back to um, green light, red light. It's, it's the contestants that are looking up to the money, and the money is looking good up there, right? This is what it looks like in Riverside. Same, same thing as in San Bernardino County. The ones who did well in terms of wages, they have fully recovered their employment. It's the ones below that haven't, right? The final thing I want to say about the Inland Empire is I want to compare vaccination rates. So here's a share of the population that is vaccinated against, corona, against COVID-19 in California. So as of October 21, we reach 60.5% that are completely vaccinated. Right? The percentage is higher if you look at um, uh, ones that received the first shot. Well, here's your shocker. You can look at San Bernardino County and you can look at Riverside County. And we are way below the California level. Right? So California was 60%, uh, San Bernardino County is 48%, and Riverside is 50%. Basically, we're 10 percentage points behind. Right? And that gives you concern because guess what? A graph made by David uh, uh, Robinson uh, looking just at Riverside County and the Coachella Valley. You remember when in California we had the four color scheme? Where if you were purple, you were basically shut down. If you were yellow, you were allowed to open. And that depended on the amount of um, case rates. Meaning, you looked at new infections per 100,000. So, new cases divided by the population times 100,000. And if that was above uh, 100, you were purple. That's the worrisome part. We're basically all purple. Los Angeles County, by the way, is basically red. That's not good either, but it's red. Europe at the moment, Germany, is all purple, right? So the concern is, are we over this or is, is there some stuff coming back? And it certainly helps getting out of the purple if the population is more vaccinated. And uh, looking here at the Coachella Valley, uh, it doesn't look that good, but then again, that's not that different from the rest of Riverside County. What about the Coachella Valley? So here are population growth rates. Um, as we know, California didn't have a great year in terms of um, population growth. Uh, we, for the first time in our history, are losing a congressional seat, right? And uh, by the way, this is all along the lines of why are people moving away from California and where are they moving to? Typically, the idea is Texas, as it comes to big firms. So who has moved recently? Tesla has moved the headquarters. Um, Oracle, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, Jamba Juice, right? Toyota. And so the question is, where, um, what, why, why is this happening and so forth? I'm, by the way, involved in a big project analyzing that exactly for the Chamber of Commerce for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the Coachella Valley does not look that bad. 
in terms of losing uh, population. You can see here what the rest of Riverside County is and the Coachella Valley. We are by no ways back to where we were in 2005, where, I mean, you look at that, those, those, were, those were growth rates per year of 6%. Do you know what it means if something grows at 5%? If something grows at 5%, then it takes uh, 14 years for that to double. So if you keep on growing at 5%, the population of Coachella Valley would have doubled within 14 years, right? That's unreasonable. If you grow at 1%, by the way, that number is 70, right? And so clearly there has been a change in growth rates in the Coachella Valley prior to, uh, let's say, 2017 and post-2017. will be interesting to follow where this is leading us. This is the population of the Coachella Valley. It's, it's interesting. Um, I met a gentleman the other day at a conference who was from um, Palm Springs. And, but he had moved uh, away from Palm Springs, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. And I said to him, guess what the largest city in the Coachella Valley is? And remember, somebody who lived here, but then moved. And of course, I wanted him to say Palm Springs. He said Cathedral City. And I said, no, it's Indio. Indio by far, right? As of the latest count, there are over 91,000 people living in Indio. What is interesting is Palm Springs, of course, is no longer even the fourth largest. It's the fifth largest because we've been passed by the city of Coachella, right? The second place is occupied by Palm Desert and by Cathedral City, where at the moment Cathedral City has a small lead, right? So that's, that's the big thing to take away. Indio, by far the largest city, right? And as, as, as you very well know, Palm Springs cannot grow um, because simply of its location. So here is the same story looked at it over time. Indio is clearly taking off, became the largest city in 1993 and, and since then has not looked back, right? And you can see um, in, in the second place there, Cathedral City and, and Palm Desert uh, moving very close together. And then, as far as Palm Springs is concerned, Coachella Valley started to, to catch up more and more and more, and it finally has happened, right, the city of Coachella. Okay, what, what else? Uh, stuff you need to know about the Coachella Valley that everyone is aware of, I think. The age structure is very different from uh, the rest of Riverside County, right? Our population here is much more centered about... Uh, uh, 45 years old and above. Um, we have substantially less percent of people uh, that are younger, including uh, uh, teenagers. Here's the good news. So in August, um, I wanted to take four of my research assistants into the Coachella Valley and because they're typically foreign students, and, and if you are from China or from Myanmar, as it turns out, uh, what, what do you know about the Coachella Valley? You have no idea, right? You've never seen the Salton Sea. Uh, you, you probably don't even know it exists uh, outside of the Coachella Valley. So I take them, and, and typically, if we go in August, we can get a four-star hotel for around $100. Right? Let's say something like the West End in, in Rancho Mirage. Um, this year, there was no way. It was $180, $190. I said, how is this possible? So it's, it's possible because look at the left of the two graphs. That's airport traffic going into Palm Springs. Right? It clearly went down basically to zero. But it really has come back up. And th these are not Canadians, because Canadians cannot travel freely, uh, even at this point, right? And international travel will just now resume this week. Uh, the U.S. is going to, 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 to open up more, right? So where, where, where do all these tourists come from? Well, there, there, there are people like me who, who live in... Uh, um, uh, in, in East Los Angeles uh, County or 
just uh, in San Bernardino County who come here and want to have a holiday. Well, we can travel abroad, so what do we do? Uh, we go to places like uh, Palm Springs in the summer, right? which otherwise you wouldn't have done. Uh, or you go to Big Bear, uh, you should look at the rates there. Um, uh, at any rate, the good news is if you look at the left graph, for the summer months, which are the low months, we have set new records. The, the, in the left graph, sort of what was nice before 2019, look at the peaks. If, if you ever, by the way, wanted to show someone what seasonality does, this is the graph to show them, right? This goes with employment in the Coachella Valley. Um, look at the peaks. So until 2011, in Palm Springs, the peak actually went down from 2007, right? That's from the Great Recession. And then it takes off, and life looked really good. By 2019, we were really doing well, right? And then, of course, coronavirus happens. Um, but the bottom line is, if you look at the bottom, we are now setting new records. And, and the question will be, of course, if this carries on into uh, the high season uh, as it is coming up, right? We all know that the tennis tournament in Indian Wells was not as well attended as it typically is when it is in April. Um, but we hope that this will change and that next time the Coachella Valley Festival is around and Indian Wells and the golf tournaments, that the attendance will go back up, right? Look at LAX on the right side, same thing. Uh, except for LAX has not really recovered. LAX is sitting at 60% of its traffic at the same time uh, two years ago. And why is that? No international travel, right? Again, hopefully this will change and hopefully California and Los Angeles County will do better uh, uh, starting in, in November as we allow more uh, international travel. This is the Coachella Valley by industry. Again, the, the data I can have at the moment from the EDD is only until March of 2021. So that's quite a bit behind, but you cannot get that data until another month or two, right? When we will post an update. And what is it that you needed to know about the industry, right? There were five industries in the United States that were primarily affected by the recession. What were they? Leisure and hospitality. Sounds familiar in the Coachella Valley? Education and health. You would say, well, why would education and health be affected? Because it's a coronavirus uh, situation, right? The reason is because you postponed all other health considerations, uh, uh, such as going to the dentist. Um, not going to the hospital unless you really had to. All of that was postponed. Same in Europe, by the way. This is not just in the United States. So that's the second sector that suffered. What else? Retail trade. Sounds familiar for the Coachella Valley, right? And then what else? The other ones are professional and business services. And finally, other services. Other services is uh, manicure, pedicure, um, spas, uh, hair cutting and so forth, right? Those were heavily affected, but there aren't that many people working in that sector. So the, the graph here looks a little bit complicated. Think of the orange first. The orange shows you, compared to February 2020, how much that industry contracted. And, and leisure and hospitality in the Coachella Valley contracted by 50%. 50%. Half of the employment went down, right? Um, information went down by 40%, but there aren't that many people working in information here, right? Retail trade, you can see it. Um, and what is the blue bar? The blue bar is where we currently are. So the difference between the orange bar and the blue bar is how much we have recovered, right? And that means in leisure and hospitality, we are still sitting at 30% or roughly 30% where we used to be uh, in, in February of, of 2020, right? We still have ways to go in that, in that sector, right? Other sectors such as retail, 
uh, professional and business services, basically have recovered. Other services has not, but there aren't that many people working in it. This puts things into perspective. Instead of percentage loss, uh, what I have here is number of jobs lost, right? There were 16,000 jobs lost in leisure and hospitality, right? Remember, other services looked so bad, but, but there aren't that many people in there, right? So even though we're still 34% below where we were in February of 2020, there aren't that many people in there, right? Retail trade is still suffering. What about the cities in uh, the Coachella Valley? So the same graph here, the blue bar means at the, at the height of the recession, how many jobs did these cities lose? And where were the big losers? Palm Desert and Palm Springs. Why? Leisure and hospitality, right? Both of them lost basically 8,000 jobs. Who lost the fewest ones? Well, Indio, by compared to its size, didn't lose that many. And look where they are. They are basically 3.3% of where is, is still the, the amount of employment they have to recover, right? The city of Coachella, same thing, or Desert Hot Springs, right? It's, it's the wealthier areas that are still uh, 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 suffering. Here's an example of getting data quicker. So um, a team of researchers at uh, Harvard University and Brown University uh, collected data on gains or losses in small business revenues from February uh, of 2020 to April, or in this case to May, right? And the red areas are the ones that had the heaviest losses. Palm Springs, 80% drop in revenue over that time period. At the same time, you go out to Indio, there's a 2% gain, right? And this, by the way, is, is a phenomenon that we've observed in the entire United States. Uh, I teach at Claremont McKenna College. In Claremont, the revenue went down by 82%. Uh, in the city next door, Upland, where I live, it went up by 2%, right? You can do the same thing with going to Malibu on the coast and, and so forth. The richest areas are the ones that lost most of the revenue. Remember, you still had to go and buy groceries, right? So, so your, your revenue there didn't go down by that much. Um, I'm running out of time, so let me go through the housing market very quickly. Uh, and uh, the housing market looks interesting, and it's, it's not very different in the Coachella Valley as it is for the rest of uh, Riverside County and um, San Bernardino County, right? So sales uh, year over year have gone down everywhere, uh, in Riverside by 15%, uh, in Orange County by 14%, but prices have increased, right? Um, if I go to home prices, and look at the home price changes within the Coachella Valley. Uh, we, we had seen before that home prices everywhere went up. Now you look at some of the increases from a year ago, and you look at Indian Wells at 32%. That is huge. Cathedral City, 33%, right? The lowest increase is 0.3% in Palm Springs. And that is, of course, a function of having very low interest rates, so if you can afford a house, uh, you, you, you're about to, uh, to, to buy it. And at the same time, it's, it's a sign of also low inventories that are sitting there. So I've listed here the inventories um, for the uh, Southern California counties, right? And so Riverside and San Bernardino have, have two of the biggest ones, but even that is, is low by historical standards. So that gets us to the, to the final two slides, which is the forecast for the, for the following year. And uh, despite the fact that we had a low percent increase in GDP of 2% in the third quarter, we assume that in the fourth quarter this will pick up again and we will end up the year with an increase of 5.3%, which is much higher than the historical average of 3%. Remember, we're coming out of the mother of all recessions, right? 
Uh, and we still assume that in 2022, that growth will continue with above average. And basically by 2023, we go back to average growth. California will see much more of an increase in 2022 because we were in, in a situation where all international businesses were cut off from us or international tourism, right? And that will write itself and therefore we see California growth rates to be higher next year before going back to normal. Um, the Inland Empire is doing much better this year than, than the United States. Uh, eventually that uh, uh, will stop in 2023 where we just see regular growth. And finally, the unemployment rate. Um, going back uh, in the United States, we will reach 4.5% by the end of the year. By the end of 2022, 3.9. And by the end of 2023, we will be back to where we were before the coronavirus uh, recession started. So I hope that uh, this gave you a good idea of where the economy currently is, how this is relevant for the Inland Empire. And uh, all of that I can hope is that in December of 2022, I will see you at the convention center in uh, Palm Springs, where, uh, if I remember this correctly, everyone, every speaker gets introduced with uh, a rock song, right? So uh, music comes on and, and we walk onto the stage, which is much more exciting than just uh, walking up to a camera here. At any rate, um, as always, I've enjoyed uh, working for Coachella Valley Economic Partnership and hope that the next year will bring uh, great success to the region. And I think there are many signs that it will currently. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. As always, your presentation gives us a lot to think about. Before we go, I'd like to take one more opportunity to thank those sponsors who made this event possible. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our platinum sponsor, Hunter Johnson. Our gold sponsor, Wells Fargo Bank. Our silver sponsors, our partners, our city sponsors, and our media sponsors. I'd like to let you know that all viewers who registered for the summit in advance have automatically been entered into a drawing to receive an iPad courtesy of platinum sponsor Hunter Johnson. The drawing will take place immediately following today's event and we'll be reaching out to the lucky winner this afternoon. A reminder that like last year, all registered attendees will receive via email a link to view and download the annual economic report as soon as it becomes available. Thanks again for supporting CVEP and helping to drive innovation and enterprise in Greater Palm Springs. This concludes our program. We hope we gave you many things to think about and ideas to act upon as we work together to pursue a more prosperous future. Thank you for joining us.